Right now on Morning News Now, a special counsel showdown shaping up in Washington over an investigation into President Biden. This morning, special counsel Robert Hur set to testify before Congress about the president's handling of classified documents and Hur's decision not to file charges, as well as his scathing assessment of President Biden as a, quote, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. We have team coverage ahead of today's testimony and how it could impact the 2024 election. Also today, it's primary day in four states. This morning, voters in Georgia, Hawaii, Mississippi, and Washington state heading to the polls as President Biden and former President Trump look ahead to an all but official 2020 rematch. I heard a very angry man who's losing badly in the polls, who's willing to weaponize government like has never taken place in this country. My predecessor failed the most basic of any duty a president owes the American people duty to care. We'll have the latest from the campaign trail, plus cash, credit, or buy now, pay later. More young people using the popular play payment plans for everyday purchases, but could it come at a bigger cost? We will break down the fine print. And totes trending. Move over, Stanley Cups. There's a new hot ticket item in town. We'll break down the bizarre frenzy over mini tote bags from Trader Joe's. <laughs> This is true. Mm. This is all I sh over I the shopped internet. there. I had no idea. <laughs> people are saying I went to seven stores. They're collecting all the colors. Huh. I'll keep an eye out for that. Good morning. Yeah. Good to have you, you with us. You can make money off it. You should. <laughs> I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We're going to get started in Washington, where today the investigation into President Biden's handling of classified documents is set to be back in the spotlight. The former special counsel who investigated Biden, Robert Hur, is set to testify before a congressional committee. Her special counsel report, which was released last month, said that that President Biden, quote, willfully retained and shared highly classified information when he left his post as vice president. But her found there was not enough evidence to bring charges against him. The report also delivered a stinging assessment of the state of President Biden's memory, saying he was unable to recall details during his interviews with investigators. President Biden responded, saying, quote, I'm well-meaning and I'm an elderly man and I know what the hell I am doing. We have full team coverage of today's testimony with NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin and NBC News justice and intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian. Thank you both. Julie, let's start with you. This is going to be the first time Robert Hur addresses the public since that report was released last month. What are we expecting to hear? Yeah, and what a hot seat to be in. For the first time, he's going to address this publicly before the House Judiciary Committee. This is the same committee that has launched the impeachment investigation, the inquiry into the president. Jim Jordan, the chair of the committee, is certainly going to press uh, Robert Hurst, specifically on what you just laid out in the intro, on Biden's mental fitness, on his acuity. Uh, that elderly, that well-meaning elderly man phrase was, of course, taken directly from that 388-page report. And certainly Republicans are going to use this time uh, to press him on that, why he included that in the report, and why he didn't charge the president, because Again, there is also a special counsel investigation, charges of which the former president is expected to face this week in Florida. Uh, but Democrats are expected to point to the very key differences between President Biden's case and between the case with the former president. This is something we know Democrats are going to push her on. Her also included in his report why those two cases were so different. So certainly we expect both of those things to come up. But again, we don't expect her himself to stray too far outside of this uh, report that he delivered uh, last month, guys. Ken, the White House has been critical of the characterization of the president and his memory in this report, which said, quote, openly, obviously, and blatantly violated Justice Department policies. Did Hur's characterization of Biden go beyond what we would normally see in a report like this? No, because reports like this, Savannah, are almost always confidential. They're declination reports written in private, so they include a lot of derogatory information about the person uh, who is not being charged because it's the results of an investigation. Look, we have Rob Hur's opening statement now, and in that opening statement, he defends his use, his characterizations of President Biden's memory in that five-hour interview because he says it was crucial that Biden's memory and his mental state was crucial to Rob Hur's decision not to charge him, despite significant evidence that President Biden had willfully retained 
classified information, including a tape recording where he said, I found all the classified material. Uh, he was referring to a house in Virginia back in 2017. And so Hearst said it was entirely proper to do that. He needed to do that, in fact, to justify to his boss, the attorney general, uh, why he wasn't charging Mr. Biden, because this, uh, this is a crime of willfulness. You have to know that you're retaining classified information. And President Biden told Rob Hearst in the interview that he didn't remember ever saying that on tape or finding those classified documents back in 2017. Ken, you mentioned the Attorney General Merrick Garland. He made the decision to have former special counsel Robert Hur handle this document's investigation. What is the Justice Department saying about the report's characterization of the president? Well, so the Justice Department, when, when President Biden's lawyers objected before the report came out, they objected to this language, the Justice Department referred it to the top career official at DOJ. In other words, the top person who is not appointed by the president. And that person looked at it, his name is Bradley Winsheimer, and said, this is entirely proper. I'm sorry, Mr. Biden and your lawyers, but um, this characterization of, the, of, of Mr. Biden's memory in this report was necessary to explain the decision not to charge him. It was not gratuitous. It was not outside the bounds of DOJ policy. Uh, and uh, Merrick Garland and his people, while not involved in that decision, they tend to agree. And they say that Democrats who say they should have edited that out or somehow, uh, you know, changed the report uh, are misunderstanding what a scandal that would have been. That would have looked like political interference from their point of view, guys. Julie, where do we go from here? Does today's hearing mark kind of like the unofficial end of this investigation or will we keep hearing about this? Well, remember, this isn't happening in a vacuum. The Republicans have been investigating the president. They've been uh, pursuing this impeachment inquiry that is growing less and less popular by the week. And, and of course, this her report, the special counsel report, is not necessarily the basis by which their investigation is uh, continuing here, but it's certainly something they're going to use as a linchpin to keep it going because, again, they have been unable to provide any evidence of any wrongdoing, any foreign interference that they claim the president had had uh, with his son, with his friends, with his brother. And so certainly this special counsel report is a moment that they're going to try to use and one they're trying to milk ahead of the election. Again, as I mentioned, you also have the former president facing charges this week in Florida for his handling of the special counsel, uh, special documents case, classified documents case, excuse me. And certainly this is a moment in which Republicans are going to try to use, they're going to try to capitalize. And again, they are still demanding documents and the full transcript of the uh, interview and the video portion portion of the interview as well. So we anticipate that after today, they will continue on. All right, Julie Serkin and Ken Delaney with a preview of today's testimony. Thank you both. Now let's get to the race for the White House. Today is primary day in several states as former President Trump looks to officially lock up the Republican nomination for a third straight time. Trump is less than 150 delegates from clinching the nomination. Today we're going to see nominating contests in Georgia, Hawaii, Mississippi, and Washington State, and those states could put him over the top. The former president became the presumptive nominee after a strong showing last week on Super Tuesday, forcing Nikki Haley to drop out of the race. NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns joins us with the very latest. Dasha, good morning. So we're not really expected to see much drama today at the polls, but how likely is it that Trump does officially clinch the GOP nomination tonight, reach that threshold? Hey guys, good morning. So the magic number is 1,215. That's how many delegates he needs to officially become the nominee. Right now he has 1,076. So a little early morning math for you here. He needs 139 more. There are 161 up for grabs tonight. So there's a high possibility he does get there tonight. But of course, it ain't over until our decision desk makes the call. <laughs> Dasha tackling math early in the morning. We appreciate <laughs> appreciate that. So the Trump campaign is pretty much taking over the Republican National Committee. At least four senior staffers were fired yesterday, according to two sources familiar with the matter. What's going on here? What can you tell us about this? Yeah, at least four fired, potentially as many as 60 employees impacted. So the RNC met in Houston last week to install a new pair of leaders selected specifically by the former president, Chairman Michael Watley, who previously led the North Carolina Republican Party. And, of course, there's been a lot of talk about this. Uh, former President Trump's daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, as co-chair. And Chris Lasavita, who's essentially a, a Trump co-campaign manager, stepped into the role of chief operating officer at the RNC. So this is a full-on uh, remaking of the RNC in Trump's image. There's going to be, guys, very little daylight now between the Trump campaign and the Republican National Committee.
Dasha, we also have some news uh, involving one of the legal cases with the former president we want to ask you about. So his attorneys have asked the judge presiding over the New York hush money case to delay mm -hmm. this trial until after the Supreme Court issues that ruling on presidential immunity. What's the Trump team arguing here and what do we think so far? Right, so this is kind of a long shot 11th hour bid here, and it came as a bit of a surprise because it came after the deadline for pretrial motions had passed. But basically, the Trump team is arguing that some of the evidence that will be used against him in this in this case pertains to, quote, official acts that should be kept out of trial. Because remember, his presidential immunity argument pertains to official acts he took as president. So his lawyers argue that they should be immune from prosecution. They specifically reference certain tweets and public comments from 2018 that he made about Michael Cohen and some business records that Trump signed off on uh, relating to those hush money payments. So his lawyers are asking for the trial to be delayed until after the Supreme Court issues its ruling on the scope of presidential immunity. Um, arguments in that case are scheduled for April 25th. And then one more case to talk about. Trump expected to attend a hearing on Thursday in the federal criminal case involving his handling of classified documents. That's the case in Florida. His attorneys want to get that one thrown out. What can we expect there? Yeah, oh my gosh, you're reminding me it's going to be a really busy week, Joe. Uh, yeah, Judge Cannon said that Thursday's hearing is expected to take all day. Trump's legal team and prosecutors from special counsel Jack Smith's office are expected to argue their positions on whether some or all of the charges against Trump should be thrown out because of the Presidential Records Act before the case actually goes to trial. The special counsel, though, has urged Cannon to reject Trump's claims that the uh, that his presidential records can, quote, be transformed into personal records uh, upon being removed from the White House, guys. All right, Dasha Burns, thank you so much. New Jersey Democratic Senator Bob Menendez and his wife have pleaded not guilty to new federal obstruction charges. The two new charges brought by prosecutors relate to alleged attempts by Menendez and his wife, Nadine, to cover up illegal bribes. These charges bring the total number of federal charges against the senator to 18. The couple is accused of taking bribes of gold bars, cash, and a luxury car in return for the senator's help with projects pursued by three New Jersey businessmen. Menendez has denied any wrongdoing and called the indictment a, quote, flagrant abuse of power. That trial is set to begin in May. An aid ship carrying 200 tons of food for Gaza's starving population has finally set sail from Cyprus. Now, the ship had been delayed and could take up to two days to arrive. The U.N. says Gaza is on the brink of famine. Relief organizations are resorting to airdrops and now sea transport to deliver aid amid accusations from the U.N. and aid agencies that Israel is blocking aid trucks from getting into the besieged enclave. Speaking yesterday, the U.N. Secretary General again urged Israel to allow more life-saving aid into Gaza. My strongest appeal today is to honor the spirit of Ramadan by silencing the guns and removing all obstacles to ensure the delivery of life-saving aid at the speed and massive scale required. International humanitarian law lies in tatters, and the threatened Israeli assault on Rafa could plummet the people of Gaza into an even deeper circle of hell. NBC News International correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us now from Tel Aviv. So Raf, this aid ship finally on its way to Gaza. Clearly, though, it's going to take some time to actually get there. So what can you tell us about this shipment? Any other efforts to get aid there faster? So, Joe, this is a Spanish ship. It's called the Open Arms. It's a charity vessel. It finally set sail from Cyprus today for what, as you said, is going to be a painfully slow voyage to Gaza. This ship traveling about three miles an hour, partly because you have the ship, but then behind it you have this enormous barge that is carrying a lot of the food, much of it supplied by the U.S. charity World Central Kitchen. It is going to take about three days before it reaches the coast of Gaza, and it remains very unclear what happens then. How do you actually get the food off of this ship onto the coast and get it safely distributed to people who need it. In terms of alternative routes, 
The Israeli government has said it is opening a new ground crossing. This will be near Kibbutz Beri, one of the kibbutzim overrun by Hamas on October 7th. That will get food directly into northern Gaza, where it is most badly needed. The timings on when that crossing is going to be open remain unclear. And then finally, there is that longer-term U.S. effort to build a temporary pier off the coast of Gaza to really ramp up humanitarian aid. But U.S. officials tell NBC News that could take at least two months. Mm. Raf, we know Ramadan started yesterday. Many Palestinian Muslims will be heading to the Al-Aqsa Mosque that's in Jerusalem, and it's one of the holiest Islamic sites. But we do understand that Israel is imposing restrictions on Palestinian visitors. You told us a little bit about this yesterday, but give us the latest about that and, and the regional reaction to those decisions. Yeah, so we're getting a broader sense of these restrictions now. For Palestinians coming from the occupied West Bank, it is a very limited group of people who are going to go to the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Men over the age of 50, women over the age of 50, and children under the age of 10. So put that differently. If you're a Palestinian in the West Bank and you are between the ages of 10 and 50, you are not going to be allowed to go to this holy site during the month of Ramadan. For Palestinians with Israeli citizenship, there are no formal restrictions by age. We saw when we were in Jerusalem yesterday that young men were having trouble getting into the mosque. They were being turned away at certain points by Israeli forces. And the Israeli government says it reserves the right to restrict the numbers going up to the mosque for safety reasons. You can fit about 300,000 people up there, but then you have the potential for crushes, for stampedes, for accidents. The Israeli government says it's not going to allow that. Guys. Raf, we also talked yesterday about President Biden's comments on Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu saying that he was hurting Israel more than helping it. Well, now the U.S.'s own annual intelligence assessment says Netanyahu's viability as a leader might be in jeopardy. What are we learning here? Yeah, Joe, this is really interesting. This is some political analysis inside of this annual unclassified threat assessment that the U.S. Intelligence Committee or community releases to Congress. And it basically said Netanyahu's political prospects are bleak. And that is an assessment that is backed up by the polls here. Uh, a small minority of Israelis want Netanyahu to continue in office on the other side of this war. A majority of Israelis want elections early for a new government. And this analysis also suggested that you could see a more moderate Israeli government replacing this far-right current government under Netanyahu. That also appears to be backed up by polls here, which suggests that Benny Gantz, who's the leader of one of the centrist parties that's actually joins the war cabinet, is the favorite to be Israel's next prime minister. Guys. All right, Raf, thank you so much. This morning, police are aware of the death of a former Boeing employee turned whistleblower. 62-year-old John Barnett was found dead on Friday in what the Charleston County Coroner's Office described as an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. Now, authorities have ruled out foul play. Barnett worked for Boeing for 32 years as a quality manager before retiring in 2017. Since his retirement, he's been outspoken about safety concerns at the company. He filed a whistleblower complaint against Boeing in 2017, raising concerns concerns about the company's production standards. He also filed a retaliation lawsuit against Boeing that was set for trial this June. His death comes amid a series of recent dangerous incidents involving Boeing planes. The Justice Department just launched a criminal investigation into the company following that mid-air blowout of a 737 MAX 9 plane in January. Let's get you over the weather. There's a new storm bringing winter alerts to the northwest this morning. You're all just Angie Lastman's tracking the latest for us. Hey, Angie, good morning. Hey there, guys. Good morning to you. You got that right. We've got another storm out west. It's going to bring us some rain, some snow, and then eventually down the line, we could be see we could be seeing some severe storms from this. Let's start with what's happening right now. There's your satellite and radar. You can see there's some snow falling across portions of the Rockies. We've got some rain working through San Francisco, Seattle. It's a soggy morning in some of those spots, and we've got winter alerts up for basically those same regions. You can see the winter storm watches in blue across the Rockies. We've got winter weather advisories and uh, winter storm warnings as well. These are going to stay in effect here for the next day or so. And you can see why. The system will work a little farther to the east. It'll bring the potential for some uh, some more snow through that region as the day goes on, but also across parts of the Rockies. And then it really ramps up for tomorrow. And not only do we see additional snow for, again, the Rockies, but we'll also see the potential for some of these stronger storms to develop in the midsection of the country. We're going 
going to see also heavy rain be a possibility with this. But when it comes to the stronger storms, the hail, the tornadoes, those are going to all be on the table. I'll show you that here closer in a moment. When, when we look at the snowfall totals, anywhere from a six inches to about a foot, maybe a foot and a half is possible, especially as you get up into those higher elevations. But this is going to be some heavy, wet snow accompanied by some strong wind gusts. That means travel likely going to be difficult in this region through the next couple of days. This goes through Thursday. Uh, so we'll be dealing with, of course, the snow falling in that region here, at least for the next two days. Now, the severe weather that I mentioned, this is tomorrow. This is a look at the bullseye for the greatest chance that we could see some of those stronger storms developing. It looks like Kansas City to Concordia in that bullseye we'll see the potential the largest potential is going to be for the for hail two inches in size or higher that's hen egg size but we could also see some of those strong wind gusts 60 miles per hour or greater and we're not going to rule out a couple of tornadoes as we look ahead to thursday another day of severe threat and this time we've got 18 million people at risk of this some strong wind gusts that's that looks like what we'll be watching for the greatest potential to see but hail and of course tornadoes not um, not out of the question then either We've got Dallas, Little Rock, Springfield, Des Moines, all included in that. Uh, and this system will continue working to the east here as the days go on. One other note today, we do have low humidity and some strong winds across parts of the southern plains. So that fire weather that we've talked a lot about over the past couple of weeks, it continues to be an issue. We'll have a, an elevated risk of that here from Wichita to Amarillo and down through El Paso here as we get through the day today, guys. Uh, lots going on. We've also got some spring-like temperatures that we're going to track here through the next couple of days across parts of the country um, and the roller coaster ride continues yeah I'm gonna enjoy the next few days here in the Northeast I know. 60s <laughs> I know break out the shorts and t-shirt and I'm impressed by your bird egg size knowledge hen, hen egg size <laughs> Too very inches. specific. I love it. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. <laughs> Google it. Much more to yeah, come exactly. here on Morning News. Now, later this hour, a troubling trend. More teens going to the doctor for issues related to mental health. We're going to explore the issue and what you can do to offer support. At first, though, stepping down, Haiti's prime minister resigning following weeks of unrest and the threat of civil war. The latest developments when we come back. Welcome back. We have new details on President Biden's 2025 budget proposal, including what it allocates for border security. The budget includes a $4.7 billion emergency fund for border security. That money will help the Department of Homeland Security ramp up operations if there's a migrant surge. The proposal is expected to face an uphill battle from congressional Republicans who are opposing the president's entire budget plan. For more, we are joined by NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley. Julia, always great to have you with us. So walk us through President Biden's wish list for the southern border. What is the White House asking for? Well, they're asking for basically what would be like a break glass fund where they want to be able to tap into reserves of about $4.9 billion in order to accommodate if there's a major surge at the border. Now, they don't have exact numbers, so they want to be able to allocate more resources, more people, more transportation, more detention space to certain parts of the border if they see surges. That would be similar to what we saw in Del Rio, Texas and Eagle Pass late last year. It's similar to what we saw uh, in El Paso at the end of Title 42, where there were migrants, hundreds of migrants sleeping on the streets, even in airports. It's to be able to accommodate for big surges. Um, they also want to be able to give more money to the court system so that anyone who crosses the border gets to find out very quickly in a matter of months rather than years whether or not they stay here. That's been a big problem so far. There's a 2.9 million case backlog. They want to be able to cut down that backlog with more immigration judges. They also have more money for uh, the number of Border Patrol officers is, uh, who can scan for fentanyl at the border, as well as new technology to stop fentanyl, and Border Patrol agents who would be doing the actual apprehension. And then they have enough money not to expand the number of ICE detention beds, but to at least maintain the 34,000 beds they already have. This is not just a normal budget request because it comes after they've been asking for money twice already because they say they're really in dire shape here. So, Julia, big picture, Biden administration wants $13.6 billion for border security. Republicans are saying no. What are Republicans' big concerns about the border? How do they want it secured? Well, they do have a bill. There was this bill called HR2 that was extremely conservative, didn't give any money for anything really for asylum protection and, and really would have kind of obliterated a lot of the, the international norms that the U.S. has been complying with 
throughout the past, you know, basically since World War II, uh, that has been their wish list. And they, although there was a bipartisan proposal in the Senate, it didn't get through because, of course, a former President Trump basically signaled to Republicans that that was too weak. And really, since then, we've seen Republicans in a complete standoff over this issue, where they're really not able to not only negotiate law, but also give money, because they think that until Biden can control the border, why should they give more money to that policy? The only problem is that's a pretty cyclical argument, because if they don't get more money, it's pretty hard to maintain control. Quickly, Julia, if this budget proposal cannot get the approval of Republicans on the Hill, can anything get done through something like executive action? Well, they can't get money through executive action, Savannah, but they certainly could take some steps. And we understand that the White House and DHS are still reviewing a number of options, including some that would expedite deportation and sort of a last in, first out policy to try to deter more migration across the border. Those people would be prioritized for deportation. Also, they could try to find new ways to raise the bar on asylum. But as we've seen time and time again, I mean, Biden's taken hundreds of steps of executive action steps on the border, and not all of them have really stuck because at the end of the day, if they don't have the resources to execute it, these things fall flat. All right, Julia, thank you so much. Haiti's prime minister is stepping down. He made the announcement this morning in a short speech posted to Facebook. Speaking a day after Caribbean leaders met to discuss the unrest in Haiti, Ariel Henry said that he will resign once a transitional council and replacement prime minister have been appointed. Henri had been under pressure to step down amid an unprecedented wave of gang-related violence and unrest that threatened to drag Haiti into a civil war. The situation is so bad that Henri has been unable to return to Haiti and remains stranded in Puerto Rico. Let's you more international headlines now starting in India, where the government is now implementing a controversial citizenship law that excludes Muslims. NBC's Claudio Lavanga joins us from Rome with that and other world news. Claudio, good morning. Joseph, a good morning. That's right. On Monday, India said they will introduce a new citizenship bill that will exclude Muslim immigrants. Now, the new rule provides a fast track to citizenship to, for immigrants from Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Pakistan who belong to persecuted religious minorities, including Hindus, Buddhists and Christians, but not Muslims. Now, the bill originally passed by India's parliament in 2019 was heavily protested by opposition parties who claim it's unconstitutional. Let's now go to Ukraine, where the Vatican's envoy has been summoned after the Pope on Monday said in an interview the country should have the courage to raise the white flag against Russia. Now, Ukraine's foreign ministry said, and I quote, that the Pope will, have to, will be expected to talk about the need to immediately join forces to ensure the victory of good over evil, as well as appeals to the attacker, not the victim. A Vatican spokesperson on Monday later said the Pope didn't mean to advise Ukraine to surrender but was talking about stopping the fighting through negotiations. And today, the Vatican Secretary of State reinforced that message by saying that the first condition for negotiations in Ukraine is that Russia holds its aggression. And let's end this tour of the world in Peru, where a dog was saved from a swollen river. A video posted on social media shows agents springing into action to save the scared dog. One of the agents tied a rope around her waist and fearless, fearlessly stepped into the river and get the dog back on dry land. In the end, both the dog and the agents uh, got out of that, well, let's call it hairy situation. <laughs> back to you guys. Oh, I'm glad to see it. Claudio, thank you so much. Well, coming up, a settlement reached in the legal battle over a controversial Florida law that critics call the Don't Say Gay law will break down the agreement between education officials and civil rights attorneys and what it means for classrooms across the state. Plus, it's being called popcorn brain, but could the struggle to focus be caused by your smartphone? We're going to break down the possible link and how you can fight it. Our weekly check-in is next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. Students and teachers in Florida classrooms will once again be able to speak freely about sexual orientation and gender identity. This comes as part of a lawsuit settlement between Florida education officials and civil rights attorneys who had challenged what critics have called the state's Don't Say Gay law signed two years ago by Governor Ron DeSantis. NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton's been following this for us. She joins us now with more. Let's talk about the terms of the settlement. Uh, critics say don't say gay. I guess you can say gay now. I mean, what are the restrictions here? Well, Joe, this is going to be a huge change because it is going to pave the way for students and teachers to once again talk about LGBTQ issues, to have clubs like the Gay Straight Alliance, 
or in some cases for teachers who are LGBTQ themselves to put photographs of their family members, their kids, or pride pins and flags back onto their desks. This may sound small, but this is actually a huge cultural change for these schools. We have seen in recent years that teachers have been fleeing Florida school districts, that they have talked about a major chilling effect from this law that has made LGBTQ students feel marginalized by their classmates and made educators who identify as LGBTQ feel as though they need to leave the profession in many instances. And so to pave the way for these discussions to come back could create a completely different classroom environment. The one thing, though, that's important to understand as part of this settlement is that this means that the lawsuit brought by these civil rights groups and families will be dropped, but the core function of the law to keep from there being instruction around sex and gender sexual orientation, that part of the law is still in place. But what I hear from teachers is they never really were talking about these issues in the first place, and so they feel this is a huge win for them and for the culture and inclusion in the classroom. So this law, its actual name is Parental Rights in Education Act. Governor DeSantis had signed this back into law in 2022 and was a big proponent of it. Have we heard anything from his office since this? Yes, yeah, so this is the part that might be confusing for some folks. His office has released a statement, and they're saying this is a win for them, too. And that's because of what I just said about the law's core functions still being intact. So there will be no instruction time mm. that talks about sexual orientation or gender identity issues. But... You can have clubs. Kids can still talk about it. Teachers can still wear a T-shirt or hang a photo up in their classroom that shows who they are and, and where they come from. And that is the piece that actually mattered most to many of the families. And so that's why you see both sides calling this a win. Mm. Uh, DeSantis's team says that this is a sign, uh, you know, that their law is still going forward and that they're still, you know, uh, going to keep Florida classrooms safe. But on the other side, advocates feel like what safety means is inclusion. Mm -hmm. And for them, they feel like they've won on that front. And, and this is a law that had started with younger kids, but it, it is K through 12 now, right? Absolutely. Is that right? So, so what does the future hold? You've kind of spelled it out, but what can we expect to see moving? Well, I think there's sort of two pieces to the future here, guys. So on the one hand, people are going to start opening these clubs back up, like the Gay Straight Alliance. You may see teachers start to talk more openly again about their identity or put symbols back up in the classroom. And many of the educators are excited about that possibility. But they're also very concerned about the fact that laws like this one in Florida, but also in many other states around the country right now, that they have had a very long-term impact. That over the last two to three years, dozens of teachers have been leaving districts. And I mean dozens at the district level, mm -hmm. not at the state level. We're talking hundreds at the state level. That there are teachers who have decided to go back into the closet and no longer talk about who they are. And that just one change, one new settlement, might not change the culture that quickly. And yeah. so we could still be looking at years of impact just from this one bill. It's an important thing to note here because coming out and being out is a process and it can take time and something like this can have a long-term impact. That's right. All right, Antonia, appreciate your reporting on this. Thank you so much. Really good to see you. Thank you. Now it's time for our weekly mental health check-in. This week we're taking a look at how overstimulation from things like phone alerts can actually impact our brains. Plus, a simple but effective thing you can try to feel literally grounded lying on the floor. Joining us now to help break this down is licensed marriage and family therapist, friend of the show, Dr. George James. Dr. James, good morning. Great to have you with us. So this first study looks at how teens and young adults are actually seeing doctors more for mental health issues. We have some numbers here. It was a new study that was published in the American Medical Association Journal Network Open. The portion of all outpatient visits by adolescents and young adults that are actually related to mental health has increased sharply. It's up to about one in six visits. Tell us the story behind these figures and what your reaction is to those numbers. Yeah, good morning, uh, Savannah and Joe. What we've seen is that for young folks, 13 to 24, that uh, they are going and, and uh, sharing more mental health issues. And, and that's because we've done a lot of great work to reduce physical ailments, drunk driving, and so forth. But there's also increased mental pressure that our young folks are feeling. So we really need to encourage them of how to deal with their stress and anxiety by helping them to, to breathe, to talk about it, to do the things that might help them to decrease that so that they're not so overwhelmed and that they don't feel the pressure and be so overwhelmed with these visits uh, when they go to the doctor. Let's talk about something we tease that's about cell phone use and social media, how it could impact our attention span. If you find that you can't seem to quiet your brain, that you're constantly coming up with new thoughts, you may have a case of what one researcher is calling popcorn brain. Mm -hmm. So Dr. James, what is popcorn brain and, and how why might we be able to actually refocus our attention spans? Mm. Yeah, this is one of those things that I'm like, I'm so glad that it's out there because I thought it was just me. Uh, popcorn yeah. brain is where 
uh, these thoughts are constantly entering your mind. Like you think you're trying to focus on one thing and then pop, <laughs> here is another thought. And it, it, part of the belief is that we've had so much overstimulation, multitasking, notifications, and every time that happens on our sm smartphone or social media, there's a part of, uh, there's a, a small level of dopamine that's released that rewards us and makes us feel like it's good and we keep doing it, but it's actually unhealthy. So we want to have a uh, quiet time, we want to meditate, reduce distractions, maybe listen to lyric-free music, Music, get moving, and these things can help you to kind of get your brain back and your focus back instead of having the popcorn brain. Lyric free music, that's a good idea. So I go to bed at night. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I like that. <laughs> um, let's finish with lying on the floor because there's this hashtag floor time. And unsurprisingly, like it seems like most hashtags do on TikTok, it has millions of views. People say this makes them feel more grounded and relaxed. What's this about? Does it work? Well, th there's no actual study that will say if it works or not, but what we're using is what people are sharing. And what people are saying is that it helps them to feel grounded, right? Like being on the floor can help people to align their posture, to feel more relaxed, mm -hmm. to even be able to feel more calm. One of the things is that we would say, like, what about going to the bed? But when we're in bed, our minds and brains keep working and thinking about the day versus on the floor. It's a disruption to that. And sometimes people can feel more calm and relaxed when they do it. So mm -hmm. try it, see if it works and go from there. It's kind of like the corpse pose in yoga, which yeah. is how you end your practice usually. So there you go. Look at that. Learn something new about you every day. <laughs> Dr. George James, thank you so much. Coming thank up, you. you've heard of buy now, pay later for big ticket items. Well, now more young people are using it for things like groceries. When we return more on the spending trend and what you should know before you sign up, stay with us because Morning News Now will be right back. We are back with the payment method that is now more popular than credit cards for younger generations. Buy now, pay later has always been a popular way to splurge on big items like vacations, concert tickets, or holiday shopping. But now it's becoming a common way for Gen Z and millennials to pay for items like groceries, contacts, shoes. For more, we are joined by Investopedia Editor-in-Chief Caleb Silver. Caleb, good to see you. So according to LexisNexis Risk Solutions, consumers younger than 35 make up 53% of these people who are using these buy now, pay later users. Only just 35% of traditional credit card holders though are in that same age range. What makes this such a preferable option for young people, just for those everyday items that Joe just listed? Yeah, it's a lot more convenient, especially given credit cards and given those high APRs and APYs on credit cards these days, which are north, north of 20%. Buy now, pay later really doesn't charge any interest unless you miss payments. So you see a lot of people, a lot of younger people, moving to buy now, pay later for the groceries, for air travel, which is up 1,400% just in the last couple of years. These are really expensive items. So when you do buy now, pay later, you pay 25% down typically, and then installments of 25% until you pay it off. It's a fast, easy way to pay for something you may not have the credit for or may not have the money in the bank for right now while you're waiting for your paycheck. So we're seeing this with Gen Z and millennials. Older generations tend to be more financially stable. So is this something you expect we're just going to see with younger generations? Could it spread even more? Yeah, you can see this spreading through generations because, of, again, those high credit card fees are deterring some people from making the purchases they want today. But you're starting to see it used more for those everyday items, for toothpaste, for contact lenses, again, for travel. So it is convenient. You could see it getting to higher generations, although older people are a little bit more credit averse. The thing about buy now, pay later is you're not building credit when you use it. You're not getting any rewards points when you use it. You're just buying what you want right now and then making those payments later. If you miss those payments though, you're gonna get late fees, you're gonna get interest payments on top of that and that could ultimately hurt your credit. Caleb, some analysts worry the growth and popularity of these services uh, could ultimately kind of lead to more risky spending, maybe build some of those habits in. Is that something to be concerned about? Yeah, because uh, you're paying for something you really don't have the money for, so you're extending yourself, and if you're not managing your finances and making the plan to pay that off in time, it will hurt you down the road. They will come with a credit agency or a debt collector to get that money, and that could hurt your payments, your interest, and your credit rating down the road. So yeah, you could see people letting loose on this and not being able to control their spend, and that's kind of the thing you have to watch out for if you're using these services, but they have grown in popularity since the pandemic began, and they're probably going to get even more popular down the road. 
All right, Caleb Silver, thank you so much. Speaking of spending money, while it appears that inflation is starting to cool, for many grocery bills remain high, and it's costing families hundreds of extra dollars. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock has more on where customers are now looking for lower prices. With the competition for grocery shoppers cooking, years of inflation has taken its toll on family budgets. How important is price when it comes to where you shop? Ah, extremely important. You know, like the day-to-day, -day, you have your constraints. It's quality of food and price. While food prices have finally started to plateau, one study shows they're up 25% since the start of the pandemic. And some items remain stubbornly expensive. It's that beef, it's that pork, it's that chicken. You know, and then also the dairy category. With customers seeking out lower prices on items like milk, discount grocery store Aldi just announced plans for 800 new locations. And the milk here really is more affordable. This entire thing is about $3 a gallon, but it's also the sourdough bread and the chips, even the croissants. 90 plus percent of these products are private brand, which is one way they're keeping the price down. Other price-sensitive chains are also expanding, from Costco adding two dozen U.S. stores in 2024 to Walmart bulking up over the next five years. Could it put downward pressure on some of the other major grossing retailers to lower their prices too? Absolutely. The big stores have already had this competition in mind, but if you're a very small two or three store location, Aldi's is probably your biggest threat. Consumers just hoping all these additions lead to a subtraction on their bills. Sam Brock, NBC News, Miami. More financial news now. Airbnb is making some big changes to try and protect its guests' privacy. CNBC's Savannah Hanau joins us with that and other money news. Savannah, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. Yes, yeah, so Airbnb is banning the use of indoor security cameras by hosts by the end of next month. The company says it's seeking to simplify its security policy while also prioritizing the privacy of guests. Airbnb had allowed the use of indoor cameras in common areas as long as the location was disclosed in the listing. Under the new policy, hosts can still use doorbell cameras and noise decibel monitors, which are only allowed in common spaces and must be disclosed. Most automated driving systems aren't good at making sure drivers are paying attention. A new study from the Insurance Institute on Highway Safety finds they don't issue strong enough warnings or take other actions to make drivers behave. Only one of the 14 systems tested performed well enough to get an overall acceptable rating. That would be teammate in the Lexus LS. GM's Super Cruise and Nissan's Pro Pilot Assist were rated marginal, while others from Tesla, BMW, Ford, Genesis, Mercedes-Benz, and Volvo were rated poor. And expect to start paying more for your avocado toast. Growers saw selling prices jump about 20% in the three months ending in January. One of the industry's top growers, Mission Produce, is predicting prices for avocados will be slightly higher this spring compared to the first quarter and up to 10, up 10 to 15% from a year ago. And that's largely due to the shift in timing of the harvest in Peru, which accounts for about a tenth of the avocados sold here in the U.S. Yikes. Do you eat avocado Sorry. toast? God, I love avocado anything. Okay. I enjoy avocados. I've just never done the toast thing before. So, all right. I, I don't do the toast uh, a lot. Um, I just really like just to mash avocado and put it on top of everything I eat. Yeah, I agree. All right. <laughs> Savannah, thank you so much. You got it. Coming up, move over Stanley Cup. It's time to secure the bag. That's right. A bag from Trader Joe's that costs just under three bucks is now selling online for hundreds more. We're going to unpack the trend next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. This year's Academy Awards definitely rolled out the red carpet for big ratings, skyrocketing to a four-year high. But was it exactly enough to keep viewers tuned in? Well, let's start with the numbers. No secret that COVID rocked Hollywood over the last few years. Since then, the Oscars has struggled for eyes. Well, on Sunday, though, a staggering 19.5 million people watched. That's even up from last year's 18.8 million. And for you mathematicians out there, it's a 34% increase from the pandemic numbers. So why the boost? Well, it was an early bird special this year, starting at 7 p.m. instead of its usual 8 o'clock. And of course, didn't hurt that a treasure trove of Blockbuster titles were celebrated, including Barbie and Oppenheimer. 
Loyal shoppers at Trader Joe's know there's a lot to celebrate about the beloved grocery store, but thanks to TikTok, consumers are now packing the aisles just to get their hands on the Trader Joe's miniature tote bag. It's the latest item launched into the retail spotlight after trending on social media. The canvas bag goes for $2.99. It comes in four colors, but if you want to get your hands on one, you better hurry because it's already selling out in a lot of stores. Joining us now for more on this is New York Times internet culture reporter Madison Mullins. Alone Kircher. Madison, huh? What's going on here? Why do people want a bag? They are $2.99. They're adorable. They're large enough for a novel, a sandwich, a water bottle, and not much else. And I think it's a really satisfying gamified experience for Trader Joe's mega fans to hunt down all four of these colorful totes. So, I mean, tote bags, I guess, are having a moment since COVID began. Walk us through what makes that tote bag just in general appealing to Gen Z and what other brands saw success with, with tote bags. We all know we're in a moment where goods and services cost more than they ever have. And the humble tote bag, however, uh, remains at a modest price, at least at Trader Joe's. You mentioned this one is two ninety nine. There are a number of tote bags we've seen go viral in recent years. The classic L.L. Bean tote bag, the Boat and Tote, which is perhaps what people picture when you think of the genre, uh, had a moment in 2022 where fans started embroidering ironic phrases on the bags. Think things like emotional baggage or Prada. More recently and more expensive, we saw an influencer, Emily Merico, sell a tote bag for $120, which drew a lot of criticism and also sold out almost immediately. Expensive or inexpensive, people can't seem to get enough tote bags. So this makes sense now. I didn't know about this trend, but <clears throat> I do shop at Trader Joe's. I was there the other day. There was like a man standing in front of me and he was looking at a bag that I guess wasn't this tote bag. And he was on the phone. Was I mean, it, it, it's obviously there are people who are out on the hunt for these things. This is a reminiscent for a lot of folks of the Stanley Cup craze on social media, which we were talking about just a few months ago. Is there a reason these products are, are putting people in a frenzy? Because they seem kind of random. I mean, is there anything they have in common? I think this is, a, particularly in the instance of the tote bag, an incredibly affordable good. Stanley Cups go for a fair bit more, but are still not when we talk about a luxury good. Terribly expensive on the whole. Additionally, they're dropped in a limited run. These tote bags are going to sell out at your Trader Joe's. And if you don't hustle on over right now and get one, you might not ever get one. And can you live with that? <laughs> can, can you live? Do you, Madison, do you have one? I, I I do not have one. I am still rocking my old school, full-size Trader Joe's tote bag. I've had it for years. It's gross. It'll probably outlive me. <laughs> but then maybe other people will follow suit and they'll, and they'll want your big one when they realize that they can't get the miniature uh, bag. What, do we have any, are there any other trends like this that are sort of on the horizon bubbling up right now that we can see coming? I mean, I, I think stores would love to create this trend, I would have to imagine, because it gives them so much advertising, gets people into their stores. Oh, that's the kiss of death for a brand. You cannot manufacture this sort of moment. Trader Joe's got incredibly lucky here. I'm sure there are some folks in a room right now who are very thrilled that their budget product has become such a viral sensation. But the moment you try to court a shopper for a viral moment, particularly on TikTok, they can smell it. It won't work, we'll try. <laughs> That's good advice, it backfires, so it has to be organic. Is Trader Joe's saying anything about this? Trader Joe's is thrilled about what they're seeing, obviously. Uh, they very much condone the reselling of these tote bags at online retailers like eBay or Depop at significantly higher prices. And they may or may not have more tote bags coming down the road. Stay tuned. All right. All right. That's, that's a good one to wait for. All right. Madison Malone Kircher, fun conversation. Thanks for joining us this morning. Appreciate it. That is going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now, but stay with us. The news continues right now. Good morning. Thanks for being with us this Tuesday. I'm Savannah Sellers. And I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, we're expecting a bitter battle on Capitol Hill this morning. The special counsel in that classified documents probe targeting President Biden due to testify before Congress today at issue his scathing report that showed no wrongdoing on the president's part, but it did call into question his mental fitness and age. We're going to take you to Washington. We're also following that deadly crisis in Haiti, the embattled Caribbean nation's prime minister now stepping down after threats of gang retaliation if he remained in office. More on what the future holds 
as the country descends into chaos. Also this morning, the latest numbers on inflation in America, how it's all affecting your wallet, and is there relief in sight, plus how it could influence the Federal Reserve's stance on interest rates in the lead up to its meeting next week. And later in the hour, an in-depth look at teens and their phones. We've got some pretty surprising new research on the benefits of unplugging and what parents should know about their family's time online. We begin in Washington, where former special counsel Robert Hur is set to testify to Congress. The focus, his investigation of President Biden's handling of classified documents dating back to his vice presidency. Now, the report cleared the president of any criminal charges, but it raised questions about his memory. The president blasted the report, insisting his memory is just fine. All this is setting the stage for what's likely to be a bitter partisan clash between House Republicans and Democrats. NBC News White House Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander joins us now with more on what we can expect. Peter, good morning. Joe, good morning to you. The special counsel Robert Hur is going to step into the spotlight today and is certain to face some tough questions. Among them, why at the same time that he made it very clear that President Biden, he believed, should not be facing any criminal charges, he also declared his assessment as it related to the president's memory. Comments that the White House has said specifically were gratuitous. And this morning, NBC News has now attained a copy of what special counsel Hur is going to say in his opening statement today. I want to read through part of it where he will say, among other things, he did not sanitize his explanation or disparage the president unfairly, adding that he explained to the attorney general his decision and his reasons for it as he was required to do. This morning, after a year of public silence, special counsel Robert Hur will testify before Congress. Her, a former U.S. attorney appointed by then-President Trump, has faced fierce backlash following his report about President Biden's handling of classified material, saying he found evidence the president willfully retained documents, but not enough evidence to prove his case to a jury, citing, among other reasons, that President Biden would come across as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory, the president quickly doing damage control. I'm well-meaning, and I'm an elderly man, and I know what the hell I'm doing. Following his feisty State of the Union, President Biden is still trying to dispel voter concerns about his ability to serve a second term. I'm not a young guy. That's no secret. But here's the deal. I understand how to get things done for the American people. Mr. Trump seized on the report last month. Crooked Joe got off scot-free. Now, I don't know if you call it scot-free. They said he was a mental basket case. In fact, her did not say that. Still, House Republicans today are likely to accuse her of giving President Biden a pass and to press him for additional observations about what her called Joe Biden's diminished faculties. House Democrats are likely to zero in on her's conclusion that no criminal charges were warranted. And they'll also underscore her's distinction between President Biden, who cooperated with the investigation, and Mr. Trump, who prosecutors say repeatedly refused to return classified documents and obstructed the investigation into his conduct. He's now facing 40 criminal charges. Overnight, a key witness in Mr. Trump's indictment speaking out on CNN, describing moving those classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. They were the uh, boxes that were in the indictment, the white banker's boxes. That's what I remember loading. And did you have any idea at the time that there was potentially U.S. national security secrets in those boxes? No clue. No, I had no clue. I a lawyer for Mr. Trump declined comment to CNN. And as for this morning's testimony, we are now at NBC News getting our first opportunity to see some of that transcript between special counsel Robert Hur and President Biden. It has been reviewed by NBC News. And among other things, the president often appeared to be thinking out loud in response to specific questions and at other points recalled in detail specific events from his time as vice president. There was one other key episode where the president had said that he was asked or was angry that he had been asked specifically about his son, Beau Biden, and his death. But after reviewing the transcript, it is clear that the president himself first brought up the topic of Beau Biden's death during the course of that conversation. Joe, back to you. All right, Peter, thank you so much. NBC News reviewed the full transcript from special counsel Hur's interview with the president. White House correspondent Mike Memoli joins us now with more on that. Mike, what else did we learn about Hur's questioning of the president? 
Well, Joe, it's so interesting. Yesterday, I had the opportunity over three hours to read all 260 pages of this transcript, and it really presents a much fuller, a much more nuanced picture of that conversation over the two days than what we initially got from that report from Special Counsel Robert Hur. Of course, Hur's assessment that the president was a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory was certainly what got gathered all the headlines. When you begin to read the transcript, it actually opens with her acknowledging as he begins to question Biden that he was going to be asking him about very detailed uh, issues about a period of over 15 years ago. Biden tried to lighten the tension in the room with a joke saying, well, I'm a young man, so that shouldn't be a problem. What you read over the course of these 260 pages is an often rather boring, I have to say, back and forth about why President Biden, where President Biden, how different boxes of documents that he had accumulated over his years as vice president was moved from one location to another. Biden often said he didn't recall some of the specifics of those, but the bottom line was that he insisted that he never at any point uh, willingly retained classified information that should not have been in his possession. So, Mike, we know her brought up the subject of Bo Biden's passing in his report, a sensitive subject. He suggested the president did not recall, quote, even within several years when his son Bo died. That, of course, angered the president. He quickly responded right after the report was released. Um, after reading the full transcript, do we know what led her to that conclusion? Yeah, the, the full context around this exchange is so important to read because what her is trying to establish, it's roughly halfway through the first day of this interview, uh, about how Biden would have retained certain documents related to the issues he was working on once he left to the White House as vice president in 2017. Uh, the special counsel, Robert Hur, he lists some of the initiatives Biden was working on, including writing his book. Biden immediately then talks about the death of his son, which was the focus of that book that he wrote. But he referred to 2017 as a period in which his son, Bo, was either deployed overseas in Iraq as a member of the National Guard or dying as he was diagnosed with cancer. Now, we know that Bo Biden was actually uh, uh, diagnosed in early of 2013. He died in 2015. So it does bear out our reporting in the past that this was Biden's raising of Bo's death and the timeline at the issue. All right, Mike, thank you so much. Appreciate it. This morning, an aid ship carrying 200 tons of food has finally left Cyprus for Gaza after multiple delays. The U.N. says the war-torn Palestinian enclave is on the brink of famine and blames Israel for restricting and blocking much-needed aid from getting in. NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel joins us now from Cyprus. Richard, good morning. Good morning. Gaza is not only the most dangerous place in the world, the most dangerous war zone, it is also the most cut off. But a short time ago, an aid ship left this port here in Cyprus, heading for Gaza, bringing much needed relief. Spanish owned ship named Open Arms finally set out this morning to cross the Eastern Mediterranean to bring food to the Gaza Strip, where hunger is spreading. The U.S.-based charity running the mission, the World Central Kitchen, hopes this will pave the way for a new maritime aid corridor. We hope that this is going to be the first of many boats going to Gaza with aid because we, what is like, World Central Kitchen, have been there and understand that we need to have as many ways to bring aid to the people of Gaza. In Cyprus, we were given exclusive access to the command center coordinating the mission. Each step has to be... Uh, cautiously prepared and uh, executed. It's only about 200 miles from Cyprus to Gaza, but because the vessel is towing a barge loaded with rice, flour, beans, and canned meat and fish, it will travel about three miles an hour. The journey is expected to take three days, and getting to Gaza is only part of the challenge. Then there's distribution. With so much desperation, the limited aid trucks Israel has allowed into Gaza have often been overrun. And airdrops, which have a limited capacity, have turned deadly. Last week, medical officials say five people were crushed by falling pallets of food. So this time, the world's central kitchen is using Gazan labor to build a pier to receive the barge. President Biden has urged Israel not to use food as a weapon to pressure Hamas and called a planned Israeli invasion of the city of Rafah in southern Gaza a red line because more than a million Palestinians are sheltering there. Israel says Hamas is hiding among them. 
It is a red line, but I'm never going to leave Israel. The defense of Israel is still critical, so there's no red line. I'm going to cut off all weapons so they don't have the Iron Dome to protect them. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu responded, seeming to dismiss President Biden's opposition. We can't leave a quarter of the Hamas terror army in place. Uh, they're there in Rafa. For the people of Israel, that's a red line. We can't let Hamas survive. And caught in the middle are more than 100 hostages still held in Gaza by Hamas and, of course, the Palestinian people who are now trying to celebrate the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. Joe. All right, Richard, thank you so much. Overnight, Haiti's embattled prime minister announced plans to step down. With the Caribbean nation plunged into turmoil and racked by gang violence, Prime Minister Ariel Henry had been under pressure to resign. NBC News correspondent Marissa Parra has the latest. This morning, Haiti descending further into chaos. After over a week of some of the worst violence the country has seen, the prime minister of Haiti overnight announcing his plans for resignation, releasing this video statement urging calm for the people of Haiti, saying he and his team will resign after the transitional consul is created. The resignation coming the same day leaders of the Caribbean nations held an emergency meeting over the crisis in Jamaica. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken flew down to meet with the leaders, saying earlier Monday that Haitians cannot wait any longer for a path to security, stability and democracy. What we've seen in recent days again should remind us that the already challenging and difficult security situation has now deteriorated even further. Instability has worsened in Haiti since the 2021 assassination of then Prime Minister Jovenel Moise and Ariel Henry then came into power. Best-selling author Mitch Album runs an orphanage in Haiti and spoke to Today in 2021 when 17 members of a missionary group were abducted by members of a Haitian gang. There's not a lot of hope because you're right, the government has collapsed. The police, uh, you can't trust. Uh, one of the most notorious gang leaders is a former police mm. officer. But last week, gangs that usually fight each other banded together, attacking the presidential palace, the airports, even the prisons, releasing thousands of prisoners. All right, Marissa Parra, thank you for that report. Warmer weather is in the forecast for parts of the country. So let's get a check on your morning news now. Weather with Angie Lastman. Angie, good morning. Good morning. Hey there, Joe. We've got a lot going on on the West Coast when it comes to unsettled weather, but the rest of the country looks absolutely delightful. We've got plenty of sunshine for parts of the plains. We look out towards the East Coast. It's sunny and it's milder, and we're even dealing with a couple of spots that could see some potential record highs through the day today. Any guess where those are? Well, if you said the upper Midwest, parts of the Great Lakes, you got that one right. We've got 73 degrees for our afternoon temperature in Chicago today. We should be almost 30 degrees cooler than that for this time of year. We've got 75 for St. Louis, Minneapolis, even close to 30 degrees above normal too, heading to the upper 60s. Grand Island ends up into the low 70s and it's stretched across parts of the South too. Lubbock is going to be near 80 by later this afternoon. It's not just today. Tomorrow too, we keep the warmth going, feeling very spring-like, not quite as warm in places like Chicago for tomorrow, but still pretty good for this time of year 54 degrees lexington will still be into the 70s and the east coast gets in on the action as well we've got upper 60s from new york to pittsburgh richmond and charlotte sitting into those mid 70s for tomorrow's forecast now if you're looking for some cooler air maybe you don't like the late summertime temperatures early uh, or late uh, springtime temperatures or early summertime temps we are going to get back to normal here before you know it. we've really got to just get through friday before things start to moderate out we see our temperatures dropping back into the mid 50s for places like Cleveland on Friday and on Saturday. Upper 60s hold steady in Morgantown, but ending up into the upper 50s by Saturday. New York City, 67 for Thursday. That's going to be one of our higher temperatures through the next couple of days. Then we kind of taper off by Friday into the mid-60s, and we are back to the upper 50s by the time Saturday rolls around. So plenty of warm weather to enjoy over the next couple of days. Shorts, t-shirt are going to be uh, good to go for a lot of folks. We also are going to watch for the potential for some fire uh, weather to develop here. This, the bullseye for that. It's going to be El Paso to Wichita. We've got low humidity. We've got gusty winds. So we'll be watching that area here over the next day or so. And out west, I mentioned it, we've got another storm system that we're tracking. Rain, snow, those are the two impacts that are on the table through the day today. And you can see the winter alerts that stretch across that region. Uh, over the next couple of days, we're going to see plenty of snow across parts of the Rockies. The Sierra will pick up some and some of that rain closer to the coast across portions of the northwest. By the time we get into tomorrow, though, 
Mojo will watch for the potential for some strong storms. They could bring us some hail, some tornadoes, some gusty winds, and that'll be in the middle of the country. We'll watch that too here uh, over the next two days. Who doesn't like the early spring temps? Listen, there there's people? as a meteorologist, people <laughs> will complain about whatever weather I tell them it's going to be. Can't make so everyone there's so happy. Out there. I'm happy this week. <laughs> You'll so find them on Twitter you. probably. All right. Thanks, Angie. Appreciate it. Right. Welcome back. After a series of recent dangerous incidents involving Boeing airplanes this morning, we're learning that a former employee turned whistleblower against the aerospace company was found dead just months before his retaliation lawsuit was set to go to trial. Authorities have ruled out foul play. NBC News senior correspondent Tom Costello has more. So we are following two major headlines today for Boeing. Scathing new details coming out overnight that the company failed dozens of FAA audits and mechanics reportedly used everyday household items to help in the complex door fitting process. And this all comes amid the sudden death of a former outspoken whistleblower. This morning, police in Charleston, South Carolina, tell NBC News they are aware of the death of a former Boeing employee turned whistleblower. 62-year-old John Barnett found dead on Friday from what the coroner calls an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. So this is my uh, retirement plaque. Barnett retired from Boeing in 2017 after working as a quality manager for more than 30 years. Since his departure, he has taken legal action against the company, claiming he was retaliated against for raising safety issues internally, issues that Boeing denied at the time. Back in 2019, Barnett sat down with Today describing a haphazard safety culture at Boeing. From day one, it's just all been about schedule and hurry up and just get it done, push the planes out, we're behind schedule. You know, we don't have time to, to worry about issues that y'all bring up. In 2017, the FAA released a review upholding many of Barnett's concerns. With regards to his sudden death, the company released a statement writing, We are saddened by Mr. Barnett's passing, and our thoughts are with his family and friends. Production standards at Boeing are under intense scrutiny, following a series of troubling incidents involving Boeing planes. The latest on Monday, when a 787 from the South American airline Lantum apparently dropped abruptly mid-flight from Sydney to Auckland, injuring at least 50 passengers and crew members. The airline says it's unclear what caused the strong movement on the flight. NBC News has also confirmed the Justice Department has launched a criminal investigation into Boeing following the blowout door plug on a 787 MAX 9 in January. The NTSB determined the plane left the Boeing plant without critical bolts that hold the plug in place. A scathing new FAA audit also found Boeing failed to comply with its own quality control procedures. We're working with Boeing and uh, demanding that they come up with a very detailed plan within the next 90 days uh, to fix the quality issues that are out there. Meanwhile, we are learning more details about the FAA audit that we mentioned there. According to a slide presentation reviewed by the New York Times, the company failed 33 out of 89 audits carried out by the FAA over six weeks. That is a very large number. NBC News has not reviewed those slides. Spirit Aerosystems, which makes the fuselage for the plane, also failed several audits. And in one case, auditors saw mechanics using a hotel key card to check a door seal. Other mechanics seen applying liquid soap to a door seal as part of the fit-up process. Uh, Boeing tells NBC News we continue to implement immediate changes and develop a comprehensive action plan to strengthen and, they say, strengthen quality and safety and build the confidence of our customers and their passengers. They have some work to do. Back to you. All right, Tom, thank you. Scott Peterson is returning to court today nearly 20 years after he was convicted of murdering his wife and unborn child. He's seeking a retrial with the Los Angeles Innocence Project taking on his case and saying new evidence could lead to his exoneration. NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz joins us from outside the courthouse in Redwood City. Liz, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. Yes, Scott Peterson is expected to appear in court virtually via Zoom. But yes, his attorneys with the L.A. Innocence Project will be here in person for the first time. And despite investigators saying there is overwhelming evidence showing that Scott Peterson is guilty, including a jury that convicted him of that, his new attorneys are saying there is new evidence that supports his longstanding claim of innocence. This morning, convicted killer Scott Peterson set to appear virtually in court as he makes yet another attempt to get his case retried. 
The status hearing comes just weeks after the Los Angeles Innocence Project announced they were representing the now 51-year-old. Peterson is currently serving a life sentence without parole for the 2002 murders of his pregnant wife Lacey and their unborn child. At the time, Modesto police said Peterson dumped them from his fishing boat into the San Francisco Bay, where months later their bodies washed up. But the L.A. Innocence Project is now pointing to a different theory, arguing Lacey may have been killed by burglars who broke into the home across the street from the Petersons. Journalist Mike Gudgel has spent years looking into lingering questions he also has about the case, speaking out to Dateline. But when did you begin to think that they would really made a big mistake in this case? You know, it wasn't really Scott. It was um, looking into, uh, you know, all the tips. It all ultimately came down to the burglary across the street. Another big part of the new theory, a burned out orange van containing a bloody mattress said to have been found in Modesto the morning after Lacey disappeared. The L.A. Innocence Project wants to do testing on a sample of that mattress that's believed to be in police custody to determine if there's any of Lacey's DNA. To this day, former Modesto fire investigator Brian Spitolsky, who responded to that van fire, questions why that didn't happen during the trial. I had figured when the court started, when the trial all started up, that somebody would reach out to me. A former lead investigator in the original case, John Bueller, tells us he never even knew about it. You're saying that when the Innocence Project came out, that was the first you had ever learned about this orange van? Yeah, I'd never heard about it before that. I'm just confused that it never came to light. Still, he stands by the conviction. I'm completely confident that we got the right, right guy. And as far as any evidence that comes forward, test it. Let's see where it leads. And just a reminder, some of the circumstantial evidence against Scott Peterson includes him lying about a mistress, going fishing alone on Christmas Eve, the day that Lacey disappeared, buying that fishing gear just weeks before. And investigators say his odd behavior after she disappeared, including dyeing his hair and carrying thousands of dollars in cash. Now, Scott Peterson's family is expected to be here at court today to support him. As for Lacey's family, they have said nothing since the Innocence Project took on this case. The L.A. Innocence Project took it on, Joe. All right, Liz, thank you so much. I'm here to help us understand what's next is NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, good morning as always. So now with this new development, what does this mean next for the case and what do you expect to hear today? The only thing that's really happening today is this is a status conference. I suspect nothing substantive will go on. This may just be the court saying, okay, folks, what do we have here and where do we need to go procedurally? And this motion is not going to result today in Scott Peterson walking out of prison. It's not even going to result in him getting a new trial today. Instead, the motion is very specific. They want to retest DNA evidence and they have a high burden to meet to get that relief because uh, they have to show a reasonable probability that it might have affected the outcome of the trial. But also under the law in this situation, the DNA was already tested in 2019. So they have another Another hurdle where they have to show that, hey, that testing in 2019, it wasn't good enough or we can mm. do it better. And when we do it better, it might point to another bad guy mm. instead of Scott Peterson. That's quite a lot to have to show. The original investigators are still confident he's guilty. This was a conviction based on circumstantial evidence, which is common, as Liz mentioned. So just how great, how strong would any new evidence have to be to get to this point of having a new trial or even being exonerated? Well, let's take the best example for Scott Peterson. It might be that the DNA evidence matched, say, Lacey Peterson's DNA or her unborn son, Connor. That would be, uh, to say, that would be a bombshell in this mm -hmm. case. Could it result in a new trial? Likely, but they are so far from that. All you really have is evidence that there was a mattress or some cloth and some other items that may have had DNA and they may have had human blood on them. Uh, human blood is quite a far cry from being the victim's blood in this mm. case. But of course, they raise a lot of really interesting issues about the burglary that happened across the street around the same time. That also is key. The state says it happened two days later. If it happened two days later, it's impossible that it had anything to do with Lacey's uh, disappearance because by then people were already investigating. She couldn't have disappeared after the date she disappeared. So a lot of issues raised, 
fascinating theories to the extent this is truly newly discovered that warrants a new trial, that is really difficult to show. I know from firsthand experience. I feel like a lot of people, I mean, I'm wondering, there's this van, burned out, bloody mattress near the area the morning after, and it's only just now uh, entering the conversation when it comes to this particular case. And that's been more than 20 years. What do you make of that? And what could come of testing that? How could that impact this? It's not, you're right in that it's just now, but it's just now in appellate terms. And by that, I mean, you, it's amazing how glacially slow things mm. work. So for example, the DNA that they want retested, that was tested in 2019. And it was discovered, I believe, in 2015 or 2016. So they've known wow. about that DNA. Just to give you an idea how slowly things go when you're working your way through the appellate courts. Mm -hmm. So one of the other possibilities is that because this uh, van fire was likely an arson without a death, it was investigated, it seems, by the fire department and not the police department. And the fire department and the police department don't always communicate, even though you might think a van found a mile away, an arson, possible blood stains around the time of the Lacey Peterson disappearance. Should they have spoken to each other? Maybe, but we'll see. Danny Savalos, thank you very much. Coming up, an important discussion on the relationship teams have with their phones. After the break, I've got some pretty eye-opening new research on how it feels to unplug every now and then, plus what parents should know about their teens' time online and their own. I'll bring you that story next. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. This morning, we're taking a closer look at teenagers and smartphones, and it looks like today's teens spend more time online than ever before. The Pew Research Center did a deep dive on how teens and parents approach screen time. The report looks at what emotions teens associate with their devices, the impact smartphones have on them, and the very real challenges parents face raising kids in an increasingly digital age. This morning, a new reason for parents to encourage their teens to unplug. A new report finding nearly three quarters of American teenagers say they feel happy or peaceful when they don't have their phones with them. 17-year-old Malik Harris says he sees the benefits of disconnecting. I'm not just sitting there strolling, scrolling and doing whatever, wasting time. Um, I get more active with the people around me. I can kind of just relax and be in the moment. Despite those positive feelings when they put the phone down, most teens are not limiting their screen time, with 38% admitting they spend too much time on their phones. I can be sitting on my phone for what felt like 20 minutes and four hours pass by. The brand new report from Pew Research Center also shedding light on family dynamics surrounding smartphones. The agreement was when I hand you this phone, I'm going to be looking at it each month. Tess Connolly says she keeps tabs on what her 15-year-old son Casey is looking at on social media. And she is not alone. Half of the parents surveyed say they look through their teen's phone, with half also saying they restrict teen screen time. When you first heard that mom would be taking a peek in there, what did you think? I wasn't the happiest about it, <laughs> but I was also like, I just got a phone and I can kind of get where she's coming from. According to the lead author of the study, Monica Anderson, cell phone usage is a frequent source of tension for families. Part of the reason, teens aren't the only ones glued to their devices. Adults are too. Teens were more likely to report their parents being distracted than parents themselves reporting. Parents painted a little bit of a rosier picture compared to what teens had to say. Do you think your mom realizes when she's on your phone or if she's distracted in a conversation? I... I don't think she thinks it does. I think she thinks it's less than it definitely is because I think it's a good bit. What do you say, Mom? <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's probably true. Well, she admits it, right? Experts do have some tips so families can look for ways to help their teens limit screen time. Do easy things like at the dinner table or before bedtime. Tess, that mom you just said there, she actually had a really good idea that they've implemented in their family. The teens themselves can be part of making an actual contract. They even signed it and everything that way. The teen's able to have input and some agency over the rules and feel a little bit better about it. Parents can, of course, try to set a good example. That is a really important one about how you use your devices and when you use your devices. Also, talk to your kids about how they feel. See if they are feeling happy or peaceful when they are away from their phones. Well, Monica Anderson, Director of Internet and Technology Research for Pew Research Center, as well as the lead author on this report, joins us now for more. Monica, thank you so much for being live with us this morning. So as we discussed, I was so struck by how high the percentage of teens who said they felt happy or peaceful when they didn't have that device near them was. Walk us through how you conducted that part of the survey. I know you asked about several emotions. 
Yeah, sure. And thanks so much for having me. So one of the things that we wanted to do with this report is to really understand what are some of the emotions that teens might have when they don't have their phone? So we asked teens a range of emotions, ranging from uh, those on the more positive side, like peaceful and happy, uh, to feeling anxious and lonely. And by far, teens were more likely to say when they don't have their phone, uh, they feel peaceful or they feel happy. Uh, about three quarters of teens said this. Is that a good lesson sort of to, to take away from this to parents maybe reinforcing that like, hey, remember how you felt when you when you weren't um, on your phone? Maybe you can duplicate that more. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we definitely see in the study is that experiences of both parents and teens aren't monolithic. Uh, so as we see, there's some teens who already uh, admit to spending too much time on social media and smartphones. And we also see that parents think that this is a top priority for them to keep on top of. It was pretty revealing um, what was sort of at the end of that piece of tape that we played right before this, that parents and teens think pretty differently about parents' screen time, right? Give us more details on those numbers and where this disparity was. You know, one of the unique things with this study is that we were able to survey pairs of parents and teens. So we developed sets of questions to understand kind of from the team perspective as well as from the parents' perspective. And one thing we wanted to get a baseline understanding of was <clears throat> whether or not parents' own device distractions ever impact their ability to communicate with their team. And we actually see some differences from parents and teens. So when we ask parents, how often are they distracted by their phone when their kid is trying to have a conversation with them? About a third of parents said that this happens at least sometimes. When we ask teens to assess their parents, those numbers are in, even higher um, at about half. Mm. Real quick, what do you think is the biggest takeaway for families here? I think one of the things that we've seen in the study uh, and in focus groups is that you know, a lot of parents may be struggling with keeping up with their screen time. And our survey shows that if you are a parent that has challenges in keeping up with uh, how much time your teen is on their phone, uh, you're not alone. More than four in 10 parents say that this is something that's hard for them to do. Monica Anderson, thank you so much. We appreciate you joining us live this morning. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. You got it. Coming up, we've got some new economic data out this morning. We're going to bring you the latest read on inflation after the break and how it could affect the Federal Reserve's stance on interest rates ahead of its meeting next week. That's next on Morning News Now. We're back with some breaking economic data. Yeah, new February numbers from the Bureau of Labor Statistics show inflation rose 0.4% month to month and 3.2% over the year. Joining us now to pour through these breaking numbers, NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans and our business and data correspondent Brian Chung. Good morning to good both morning. of you. Brian, walk us through the numbers, how they compare with previous months. Yeah, good morning, guys. We are still on inflation watch. And the number that we got this morning showed that prices increased by 3.2% between February of this year and February of last year. So on a year-over-year -year basis, that's a faster pace of inflation that we had seen in the January to January period, where it was about 3.1%. So we're going to continue to watch it. Now, in terms of the contributors to the inflation, if we break it down to food, energy, and shelter, these are monthly figures that you're looking at. January to February, price for food interestingly went sideways didn't increase or decrease during the month energy prices though did increase gasoline prices people have been feeling that at the pump over the last month and then shelter this is the biggest cost for most americans just putting a roof over your head mortgages and rent that increasing by four tenths of a percent that's a slower pace than the six tenths of a percent mm. so worth noting there again because that's such a big expenditure for most households christine give us your reaction here and is this in line with what we thought what do we think about our economy it's a little hotter than we would have liked to have seen we saw january was 3.1 percent this is 3.2%. That means inflation ticked up. And so it, what it tells us is this last mile of inflation fighting is proving to be a little bumpy, more mm. difficult. Uh, and what does it mean for your grocery bill? Your 
grocery bill is up 25% since the beginning of 2020. So this is why wow. people are so concerned about affordability. We've got the key inflation rate here is off that terrible 9.1% of the middle of 2020. 3% is a lot better. 3.2% here in the month is a lot better. But that improvement, rapid improvement from mm. last year, seems to be slowing here. So it's got big implications for the mm. Fed. Brian, you gave us food, energy, shelter, any other categories you're looking at there? Yeah, well, let's break down the, the prices themselves for many things that people buy on a daily basis. So if we look at things like eggs, gasoline, milk, and bread, here are the prices that we saw compared to a year ago. And we saw that eggs... $3 a dozen. It was not nearly the uh, extravaganza that we had last year when egg prices really spiked across the board, likely due to bird flu. Milk prices also decreased compared to last year. It was over $4. It's uh, now just under $4, $3.94 uh, for a gallon of whole milk. Bread prices, though, however, did go up. It's about $2.01, according to the report this morning. But gasoline, this is the big expenditure for a lot of people, especially ahead of spring break. Uh, we did see prices go up on a monthly basis, but compared to this time last year, it's about 3 and a half bucks, two dollars and forty nine cents. So that's cheaper than the three sixty two that we had last year. So across the board, some of these staples are getting cheaper. But again, to Christine's point, it's been going sideways as the last few months. And again, when you compare prices overall compared to about three or four years ago, those price levels are still up. Absolutely. Christine, you just said it. Big implications for the Fed. That meeting's in about a week. What do we yeah, expect? I don't think the Fed's going to be able to move interest rates. Uh, everyone's waiting for their Fed to cut interest rates, mm -hmm. right? After all of those rapid rate increases that we feel in our credit cards, in our car loans, you know, in home loans. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I don't think you're going to see the Fed cut rates for sure next week. And then the big question is what happens in June. Right now, maybe a 50 or 60 percent chance of a, a rate cut in June. But not if you keep seeing hot inflation numbers. You can't cut interest rates when you have inflation that is still too high and an economy that is still too strong. You'd be throwing gasoline onto the fire. That would be inflationary again, right? So you don't cut rates in such a strong economy with, with inflation that is still kind of surprising right. a little bit on the upside. Of course, interest rates are key for people who want to buy a home. There's yeah. also renters. Brian, you touched on that already, but what could all this mean for people who are renting? Yeah, well, I mean, one interesting thread is that this is government data that we're talking about, and there's reason to believe that it lags considerably behind what's actually happening in the economy. So I want to show you this chart right here. <laughs> This blue line shows the yearly rate of shelter inflation, according to the government data, which we're looking at right now. This green line is the Zillow rent index. This is actually looking at what's posted online, which could be interpreted as a more real-time measure of the yearly rate of inflation. It did peak at around 16% in 2022, but you can see that the peak that was measured by CPI shelter didn't happen until the beginning part of 2023. So uh, some economists are saying that there could be a lag between the government data and other real-time measures of data by about 6 to 12 months. We'll have to see if maybe that bleeds through to other inflation reports and helps actually bring that headline number down, perhaps. So, Christine, with this report of mine, but also with what you mentioned you're yeah. expecting from the Fed coming up in a week or so, what should people be thinking when it comes to their wallets? I think high interest rates are the enemy of the family budget. And so a lot of people are in a kind of a bind right here. Their grocery bills are 25 percent higher than they were a few years ago. 20 percent plus on a credit card. Mm. You've got to pay down debt you got to pay down high interest debt. you got to really be careful about where you're taking on debt because we're not going to see rate cuts um, in the very near term here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we want to see those rate cuts a little lower that debt burden for people. But be, be super careful of, of, of especially high interest credit card debt. That would be my advice to everyone mm -hmm. here. All right. Christine, really Brian, time. thank you both. Nice Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Well, today marks Equal Pay Day. The date symbolizes how far into the year women must work if they want to earn what men earned in the previous year. Equal Pay Day began nearly 20 years ago as a public awareness campaign, but campaigners say frustratingly little has changed since then. Let's bring in Vivian too for more on this. She is the author of Rich AF, the winning money mindset that will change your life. Vivian, good morning. We always love to have you on the show. So let's talk through this, this date. It's been set at March 12th, but for some groups of women, it's actually a lot later than this, meaning that they will still not be making the same as a man until later into the year. Why has progress on this issue been so slow? You know, I think there's so many factors impacting why we haven't made larger strides towards this, but one of the largest being there's still this inherent bias against women in the office, in particular when it comes to women with families. Because women shoulder so much of the burden at home, the expectation is that they can't both be the best employee and the best parent at the same time. So they're oftentimes seen as the least hireable population. population. Women also face, Vivian, what's called the motherhood penalty. 
Okay, uh, this is a tough one. Explain to us what that is and how it continues to make this such a difficult thing to tackle, how it furthers the pay gap between men and women. Yeah, when it comes to the motherhood penalty, essentially it's that women, again, are seen who have families as the least hireable population. What's really interesting though, there's actually an alternative phrase called the fatherhood bonus. So fathers who have families are likely the most hireable and the most paid, then come single men, then come single women, and then comes mothers with families. And it's so funny because the fathers who have these families are seen as more capable, better leaders, when in fact, it's the moms actually doing all of this multitasking, working in the office, and also being those team players and leaders and diplomats at home. Okay, does that just not make you want to scream, Vivian? <laughs> <laughs> you're being very composed while you're talking about that, and it's just so wild. Um, let's talk strategy here. What can women do? at work, not that it should be on women, by the way, mm -hmm. but not only to learn from what their counterparts are making, but to be smart in how they negotiate raises and benefits. And then I think also importantly, if I may, if you can answer, what can men do? What can they do to help support yeah. the women around them? Definitely. So first and foremost, I always recommend that folks ask for a 10 to 15% raise every single year, especially women. And one of the easiest things you can do is create a brag book in your inbox folder. And anytime something good happens to you, someone praises you at work, you're congratulated, forward that email to that special folder. And that way by mid-year review or end of year review, you'll literally have a laundry list of all of your accomplishments. Mm. This is also something, you know, unfortunately that we do have to say during interviews, you are not legally allowed to be discriminated against for being a mom. So I certainly wouldn't offer that information up if you can avoid it. As for your partner, as well as your company, um, partners need to frankly just take a more equitable share of domestic labor at home. Right now, women do two and a half times as much unpaid work at home, and they would have a much easier time juggling those careers and those families if their partners could pick up some of that slack. And finally, I would say corporations actually need to offer things like equitable leave and flexible working arrangements so that the best of the best of their employees can actually do their best wherever they're working from. Vivian too, you are fantastic. Really important information and we love when you join us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Coming up, the roots of an American dream. After the break, two California families with a unique generational bond forged over a storied house. We'll explain next. We are back with rumors of a country song cover that's got the beehive buzzing. Just look at these two icons over my shoulder. Beyonce's highly anticipated country album, Act Two, comes out in a few weeks. And word is, one of the tracks could be her rendition of Dolly Parton's 1973 classic, Jolene. That's coming from the queen of country herself. Dolly Parton told the Knoxville News Sentinel that she thinks Beyonce recorded a cover of Jolene for the new album, though nothing has been confirmed from Beyonce and her team yet. Parton added that she loves Beyonce and is excited to hear the track. I know somebody else who loves Dolly Parton. Exactly. Right I, I can already hear it now. I can kind of see the vibe and I think it's going to be awesome. Right. All right. <laughs> Finally this hour, a story about home ownership in the American dream, first reported by our partners at NBC Asian American and NBC News Digital. A Chinese American family is giving back many years after a black couple rented a house to them when no one else would. NBC News correspondent Elwin Lopez shares their story. The historic Hotel Bill Coronado anchors the Oceanside California town that shares its name. It's still here. It's still here and it's still fabulous. A lasting symbol of a bygone era catering to the wealthy and the well-known. It was built in the late 1800s by thousands of workers. Among them, Gus Thompson, Bollinger Gardner Kemp's great-grandfather. Uh, he started businesses of his own. And even my great-grandmother Emma had a cafe and bakery. Gus Thompson was born into slavery, enduring a life in the Jim Crow South for decades before moving west. Later, becoming a pioneer in California at a time when the state's black population was less than 1%. And about three blocks from the resort he helped build, Gus and his wife Emma lived here in this home with their three kids. This is unbelievable. This has been here since the 18, the late 1800s? Correct, 1895 to be exact. For years, Coronado resident Kevin Ashley has been tracing the Thompson's footsteps, curating an exhibit about the city's hidden black history. And just the idea that there was a thriving African-American community 
between 1890 and 1920. Was that shocking to you? Hugely shocking. Next to the Thompson's home stands a small apartment building. It was once Gus's stable, where she would welcome people in that no one else would. The library stable was the only place for several decades where an African-American could rent a bed to sleep in Coronado. Their old original house, they usually rented out to immigrants. One of them, Chinese-American gardener Lloyd Dong. He was having trouble. There wasn't a lot available. His son, Ron, was just a toddler at the time. I get to Gus Thompson's livery stables, and he finds out that the house next door is not being used by Gus anymore. The Thompsons rented the main house to the Dongs, one they eventually bought, an act that then defied the exclusionary housing practices and gave the Dongs a foothold to start building their own American dream. So the Thompsons really gave them a chance that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Absolutely. It's a chance the Dongs have never forgotten and the favor their family is about to return. The SDSU has received a new $5 million gift in support of our Black Resource Center, which will now be named. They said, we're going to sell the property and we're going to give our proceeds to the Black Resource Center of San Diego State University in the name of Gus and Emma Thompson. What was your reaction to that? Tears. Tears? 100%. The roots of an American dream so deep it turns strangers into family. Now those same roots are still giving for decades to come. Paying it forward, shall we say, is just the icing on the cake. It's just, it's a beautiful story. And uh, maybe it's one that the world needs to hear. And more than ever. And more than ever. Mm. Our thanks to Elwin Lopez for that story. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.